All right, guys, so um, this video is going to kind of help show you what I expect y'all to do tomorrow when you take your last and final benchmark of the year before the real star test. Now, this is something that we have done all year. Remember that I tell you as soon as I tell you that you may begin, I do not actually want you to start on the test. I want you to get your periodic table and formula chart out, and I want you to start writing everything you know down. Okay, so this is going to be a video to help you with that since I am going to go through your benchmark and take these for a grade. So uh, let's start with the periodic table side. I like for all the chemistry to go on this side because it's just going to be become a lot more relevant. Okay, so of course we have to start with the one that I make the biggest fuss about all the time and that is Ape Man. Okay, that is a must, a go-to. You will always use this on the star test, even though I don't even know what questions will be on the star test this year coming up. It's going to answer some. I do know that. So let's go over that. Remember, the A in 8-man stands for atomic number. The P is proton. So therefore, whatever the atomic number is, like this little number right here, 14, is always going to be the number of protons. So therefore, guess how many protons there are? 14, which is always in eighth grade, going to be equal to the number of electrons. So a question could be as simple as, you have an element of silicon. How many electrons does that element have? Well, right there, if the atomic number is 14. That means the number of protons are 14. That means the number of electrons are 14. Okay, so that's the ape. Now let's go into the man is the mass number subtracted from the atomic number is always going to give you the number of neutrons. So let's just go ahead and use our example down here. If our mass number is 28, 28 minus 14 is 14. So the atom silicon has 14 protons, 14 electrons, and 14 neutrons. But we know that they will not always be the same. Neutrons can normally be the oddball. All right, so let's kind of go over what protons, neutrons, and electrons are. Well, we know that protons are positive. Neutrons are neutral. And electrons are negative. They are the only ones where the name doesn't fit. So let's talk about where they located. Well, protons are found in the nucleus. Neutrons are found in the nucleus. And electron, again, being the oddball, is found in the electron cloud. And the last one is mass. Well, protons have a mass of 1 AMU. Neutrons, again, have a mass of 1 AMU. AMU, and then that little oddball electron, well, he's so tiny that we consider him to have zero mass. So there you go. That's like a teak right there. Everything you need to know about the three subatomic particles. Okay, well, one of my, or some of your all-time favorite things to help you remember is what helps you to identify an atom. Well, that's ID your P, which means protons always help you to identify an atom. It doesn't matter if I add 50,000 neutrons and 50,000 electrons into that atom. If there are five, it will always be boron. The moment I add one, it becomes carbon. The moment I take one away, it becomes back to boron. So protons always identify our atom. So let's talk about electrons. How do they go in? Well, that's our 2, 8, Eight rule, remember? Two, eight, eight. The electrons will appreciate. That tells you how many can go in each energy level. Two in the first, eight in the second, eight in the third in high school. I mean in middle school, sorry. Okay? All right, well, now that we're kind of looking at this periodic table, we know that there are three types of elements. There's metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Okay, metals are always going to be found on the left. Nonmetals are going to be found on the right. And metalloids are going to be touching this zigzag line except for aluminum. 
And so I'm just going to kind of make a little code. If you have a highlighter, which you will tomorrow, you can highlight the metalloids. Okay, but do not like shade them out so you can't get this valuable information on here. So these are our metalloids. Okay, well what are all these other numbers on here? Well this number right here is called the group number. Remember groups go up and down and the group number will always tell us the number of valence electrons. Well what is a valence electron. So let's go over this real quick. So group 13 will have three valence electrons. Group 14, 4, 15, 5, 16, 6, 17, 7, 18, 8. Why no more? Because remember, we can't go higher than 8. All right. So remember, valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost energy level. And valence electrons are the ones that determine our reactivity. So let's write that here. Val E determines reactivity. Now, if you don't remember what VAL E stands for, then write it out. But like when you're writing this, this is truly for yourself. And I know that I'm going to take a grade on it, but it's really for you to help you be the best and the most successful on your benchmark. So if you can abbreviate things and later in the test, you know exactly what you meant, then by all means do it. I'll figure it out. I'll come and ask you if I have to. But if you don't understand what you're meaning when you're abbreviating it, then you need to write it out to a way that you will understand. Okay, so just like protons determine your um, identity, valence electrons determine your reactivity. All right, well, let's go and remember groups go up and down. Okay, periods go side to side. Yes, these will react the same, and no, these will not react the same. So remember, if your head goes up and down, you're nodding yes. Yes, they'll react the same. If your head goes side to side, you're nodding, you're shaking your head no, so no, they will not react the same. So what are these going side to side? These are called your periods. And this is a period number. And remember, a period number tells us the number of energy levels. Okay, so I know that sodium has three energy levels and one valence electron because it is in period three, group one. Okay? All right, so what else could we talk about? Well, let's talk about the groups and how they react. We know that down here, group one, what is so very special about them? They are the most reactive metals. Remember, they're the alkali metals. They go crazy. They are so reactive that they react violently with water. They are so desperate to give away that one pesky, annoying valence electron. It's keeping them from being happy. Well, let's go all the way over to group 17. What is special about them? They're the halogens. They are the most reactive non-metals. Well, that pesky one valence electron that group one is so desperately ready to get of, group 17 so desperately wants because it has seven and it wants to get to that magic number of eight. And then group 18, by all means, the star's favorite group to test over is called the noble gases. And what is so special about the noble gases is that they are unreactive. Hmm. And why are they unreactive? Because they have a full outer energy level. And yes, that does include helium, even though it's only two. Okay, um, well, let's go over chemical formulas. So if I say 2CaO3, okay, remember that this large number in front is called the coefficient. And the coefficient is always going to tell us how many compounds or molecules there are. So in this case, there would be two. This tiny little number that's hanging out at the bottom is called a subscript. 
and a subscript always tells us the number of atoms. So remember, if you do not see a coefficient, or if you do not see a subscript, it's always understood to be a 1, never a 0, because if it was a 0, then it wouldn't be there. And the symbols, they tell us which elements are involved, okay? So remember, count the capital letters, but if I have the same uh, element twice, do not count it twice, okay? So going into chemical formulas, let's kind of, um, let's go ahead and go into chemical equations. All right, so I'm going to come down here to the bottom. We know that reactants are always going to be on the left. You have an arrow, which stands for yields. And the products are going to be on the right. Now, the state says that you have to be able to recognize if a chemical equation is balanced. You are not going to have to balance it. You're just going to have to say, yes, it's balanced, or no, it's not. So remember, when you do that, if you have like 2H2 plus O3 yields 4H2O, remember, you're going to draw a line down the arrow, write the elements involved, and then add them up. And if they are the same on both sides, then it's going to be balanced. If it's not, then it's unbalanced. So right here, there's four hydrogens on the reactant side, because two times two. But then over here, there's eight, four times two. So obviously, I don't even have to go a step further. No, this equation is not balanced. Um, the only thing left I have to think about that would be on chemistry would be evidence. So what are the five pieces of evidence that a chemical reaction has occurred. Well, remember, city boop, 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 girls love their phones. So what does that stand for? Color, gas production, light, temperature change, and precipitate. No, not precipitation. Precipitate. Remember, that's a solid. Okay. If one or more of these occur, then you know that a chemical reaction has occurred. You know that you have made something new. Okay. And then again, if you can think of anything else in chemistry that we've gone over, by all means, add it. Oh, like org. Okay. Ch is organic. You must have carbon and hydrogen to be organic. There you go. All right. So let's flip it over to the back. This is where I kind of want you to put all your other information, biology, um, physics, earth and space, all the other stuff that we've talked about. So, of course, most of your physics is going to have to do with your math problems. If they're giving you the formula, then obviously you're going to have to use them. And unlike the math, you do not get a calculator. I know it's unfair. It sucks. I know, but there's nothing we can do about it. So I want you to make a pyramid using all four of these formulas and remember the only one that matters is the one that goes on top so looking over here if m well it's on top right there so it goes right there and then just add the d and the v d s and t now these two do not have one on top so then that must be f and w f m a w f d the way i remember which ones go on top is m d f w my DFW. And if you haven't know that, that DFW stands for Dallas Fort Worth. Okay, so just MDFW. So you are going to need to spend time when you work on these. When you do these problems, always look at your units to make sure that they're not trying to uh, make you convert because they love to do that on the star test. So if they ever ask you to calculate speed, and they give you your time in minutes, but then all your answer choices are in um, miles per hour, you need to convert that minutes into hours. So always look at your units when you're doing your calculations. All right, so let's just start with um, plate tectonics. Okay, we know that when the plates are moving towards each other, that's convergent. I'm just going to abbreviate because I know what that means. If you don't, spell it out. When they're moving away, that's divergent. And when they are sliding past each other, that is transform. Well, what geological features are made? Well, convergent, remember, there's three different types. Oceanic, continental, 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 oceanic, oceanic. Um, let's just write them all real quick. 
we have ocean trenches, volcanoes, mountains, island arcs. Okay, these are all the different things that can happen when two plates are colliding. Divergent is when they're moving away, so those are our R's, those are our ridges and rift valleys. And transform, even though it doesn't actually cause a geological feature, it can cause an earthquake. Okay, uh, continuing with earth, let's kind of talk about topography for a little bit. Remember, contour lines show elevation. The farther apart they are, the flatter it is. The closer they are, the steeper it is. Okay, if I was to tell you that this was a hundred elevation and then I was to up here, I was going to tell you that this mark right here was 300. Could you figure out what the contour interval is? Well, if this is a hundred and this is 300, then this must be 200. So the interval would be a hundred. So if I told you that, hey, you're standing here on X, how long, how high would you have to climb to get to the top? Well, if the top's 300, 300 minus 100 is 200 that you would have to climb. If I asked what the interval is, it would be 100. So read those questions carefully. Uh, okay, um, let's go into space. Even though we're kind of going over that now, it should be easy. The HR diagram. Okay, we know that as you're moving from the left to the right, the temperature's increasing. As you're moving from top to bottom, the brightness is decreasing. This is called the main sequence because most stars follow it. You have your dwarfs down here and you have your giants up here. So it could ask you any question where like what is this area down here or if I was to compare this star to this star, brightness and temperature. All right, just know that as a star ages, it gets dimmer and cooler, right? You're always you're the hottest and the brightest right up here when you're a blue star. Everybody wants to be a blue star. Okay, um, we know the types of galaxies. There are irregular, elliptical, and spiral, which is actually called disc-shaped according to the state. Remember all the things we talked about, like you can determine if the, these are young, these are old, these are middle-aged, and by the num amount of nebula that they have, this has a ton of nebula, this has hardly any, this has a mixture, kind of that, uh, so forth. So let's kind of finish going into physics. Let's review kinetic versus potential. Well, we know if you had a ball and it's rolling down the hill, that is kinetic energy, or it's okay. If the sorry, if the ball is at the top of the hill, that's potential energy. When it's rolling down the hill, it's in motion, that is kinetic energy. Okay. Um, Newton's laws. So you have the first, the second, and the third. Remember the first law is inertia. Second law is force equals mass times acceleration. This one right here. So it's force and mass. And the third one is action and reaction. Okay. Uh, balanced and unbalanced forces. If the arrows are going in the same direction, you will add. If the arrows are going in opposite directions, you will subtract. And it will always go in the direction that has the greater force. Remember, when forces are balanced, the net force will equal zero. When they are unbalanced, it will be anything but zero. Okay? So when they're balanced, it's either going to be at zero or at constant speed, which means it's not changing. Um, speed, velocity, and acceleration. You have speed, velocity, 
and acceleration. Speed is distance and time. Velocity is everything that speed is plus direction. And acceleration is a change in either speed and or direction. Okay, so pretty much the only thing left that we haven't kind of talked about is the life, um, remembering that producers, consumers. Okay, so just go ahead and write everything you can think of down, but y'all are about to get called to go home, so I will look at this tomorrow. Good luck on your test.